Those that can, do, and those that can't, talk about it. Hello, I'm Murray Walker. <laughs> It's over the line together, and it's almost a dead heat. It's Jackie Stewart. Bernie, it's some 17 years since you bought McLaren. You've had some good times and you've had some bad times. What do you remember best? I don't remember buying McLaren. Well, hello and welcome to the frozen south. And let me say straight away that it's practically a miracle that this meeting is on. This is round 14 of the 16 race world championship and the end of the European season. <laughs> now, for real spectacular driving, watch this. And nearly that's it. There's a big body job to be done. Now he's getting aboard and now, now that's it. That's it. Bang, bang and off. Off. Oh, dear. Senior is up to third. <laughs> You've got an enormous bump on your head. Can you, can you let them see it? I don't know earlier. Really. Right up there. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're out of control. We can't stop. <laughs> now, as the race starts, my regrets, we must leave Brands Hatch. Join us again at quarter to five. Welcome to my personal tribute to my Formula One greats. Now, I've deliberately confined myself to 10 of them, and frankly, they've been mighty difficult to choose from the hundreds of men who've taken part in Grand Prix races over the years. And until I get to my top three, I haven't even attempted to rank them, because frankly, it's so difficult with 50 years of racing, different men, different cars, different circuits, totally different circumstances. But I'm going to be talking to Sir Sterling Moss, Sir Jackie Stewart, Nigel Mansell, Nicky Lauda, and Michael Schumacher. And what a fantastic backdrop. The Festival of Speed here at Goodwood, a veritable feast of motor racing nostalgia where everyone has a wonderful time. So let's step back in time and remember our first Formula One great, who was Italy's greatest ever, Alberto Ascari. Plump, dapper and charming, he dominated Grand Prix racing in the early 50s, driving for Ferrari and Lancia. Amazingly, Ascari is still Italy's only true great champion of the Formula One era. In his pale blue helmet and pale blue sleeveless shirt, he was a supreme stylist. Always more comfortable at the front of a race, he preferred to dominate, and once he was in the lead, his calm, unruffled style made it all look so easy. He was the son of a great driver of the 1920s, Antonio Ascari. Alberto idolised his father and was only seven years old when Antonio was killed in the 1925 French Grand Prix. It left the young Alberto with a burning ambition to emulate him, and by the time he was in his teens, he was racing motorcycles and honing his skill and racecraft. Helped by his mentor Gigi Villaresi, Ascari joined Ferrari. In 1950, the first year of the World Championship, Farina took the title for Alfa Romeo, but in 1951, Ascari beat Fangio's Alfa to win at the Nürburgring and Monza. In 1952, he and Ferrari began an extraordinary two-year domination of Formula One. For over a year, no one except Ascari won a World Championship round. And to Alberto Ascari, a further Grand Prix victory. A victory which was to confirm him champion of the world a second time. But at the end of 1953, he fell out with Enzo Ferrari and joined Lancia, who were developing a revolutionary new Formula One car. In career terms, it was a bad move, because the new car wasn't race-ready until late in the season. 
But for 1955, Valencia looked a winner, and Ascari was leading at Monaco when drama. Tremendous excitement. Ascari has overshot the chicane. The car has somersaulted straight into the harbour. Frogman standing by, dive in to rescue Ascari. But his blue helmet pops up over to the left of the point where the car went in. And he starts to swim towards one of the yachts. He is transferred to a stretcher and taken to hospital with little worse than a cut nose and a severe shaking. Ascari's miraculous escape was tragically short-lived. Four days later, testing a sports Ferrari at Monza, he crashed and was killed. Alberto Ascari was mourned by the whole of Italy. More than any other driver, he had created the legend of Ferrari, which endures to this day. It was a tragedy that, like his father Antonio, Alberto Ascari was killed in a racing car, just as he was coming good with Lancia. Sterling Moss, then a boy wonder, was one of his rivals and later became a member of the legendary Mercedes-Benz racing team and one of my all-time heroes. In versatility and sheer talent, Sterling is the greatest racing driver Britain has ever produced. In his 16-year career, he did 529 races and won 212 of them, an incredible 40%. He'd race anything. Formula One, Formula Two, sports cars, GTs and saloons. They called him Mr. Motor Racing, and whatever the event, he always raced to win. Now, once you get in the cockpit, boy, you're thinking of one yeah, thing. Yeah, you know, you're looking yeah. at your instruments, then you're watching the flag, and then you're off. And it's, it's a thing about one man against another man. That, to me, the interest of racing is, is the, the mental battle. Brands Hatch really comes into its own on bank holidays. Well, even if the girls don't like motor racing, give them something to eat. It keeps them quiet. He started winning as a teenager in Formula 3 Coopers and moved on to Formula 2 with HWM. The patriotic Moss wanted to race only British cars, but the lack of a suitable Formula 1 car forced him to buy an Italian Maserati and paint it green. He beat the works cars, so Maserati hired him to lead their team. And in the Italian Grand Prix, until an oil pipe broke, he'd been leading even Fangio. Double. Double. So Mercedes boss Alfred Neubauer hired him as number two to Fangio. Sterling spent the 1955 season following in the great man's wheel tracks until an historic moment at entry in the British Grand Prix. Sterling beat Fangio that day to become the first British driver to win his home Grand Prix. I have to ask the question. You were wheel to wheel in the two Mercedes Benz the whole time. You crossed the line together. You were ahead. Did he let you through? I don't know. I asked him. Look, our team, our team orders at Mercedes were you could you race as you want to until you're 30 seconds ahead of the rest of the field. I thought, now I'm in the lead, I'll go like hell. I come round the last corner. I tread flat on the accelerator, I pull over, wave him past. No, he can't take me. We cross the line like that, one, two. I don't know whether he... He never I, said. No, he didn't. I asked him. He said, no, no, no. He said, it was your day, the British Grand Prix, you were driving beautifully, blah, blah, blah. A true gentleman. A, a wonderful man. After another spell with Maserati, there was finally a British Formula One car worthy of him, the Van Wall. In 1957, Moss won the British Grand Prix, the first championship round ever won by a British car. The Van Wall was quite a difficult car to drive. It was fast and I had a go, and uh, we managed to do it, and it was a big day for us. I'm very pro-English, for it to be an English car. Van Deville, of course, was thrilled, as you can imagine. It was a pretty emotive time. In 1958, Sterling won four Grand Prix, but three times the Van Wall broke when he was leading. Mike Hawthorne won only one round, but even so, Moss missed the title by one point. You insisted on driving British. Have you ever regretted that? Because you might have done even better. Oh, I think I would have done. But no, no, no. I mean, I'm British. I love England. It's the centre of the world. Uh, green was the colour I wanted to race with, and England was the country I was representing. I have no regrets at all. When I lost the title to Mike the first time, I was very, very disappointed. I thought, well, because I felt I could beat him. Second time, I was disappointed. Uh, but then you get used to it. And then I thought, well, what's it matter? If I'm the guy they want to beat, if, they, if when practice comes in, they say, well, let's see what Moss has done, if that's the thing that mattered, then, then that made the thing for me. 
After Van Wall, Moss drove for privateer Rob Walker with seven more brilliant victories, including beating the shark nose Ferraris at Monaco in 1961. That was, my, I think, my best circuit race. The reason I say that, it was 100 laps. I happened to have got pole position. And if I'd done the 100 laps at the same speed as I did pole, I'd have only been 40 seconds quicker. Um, so that gives you an idea of the pressure. Mm. I'd start a lap, Murray, and I'd say, I'm going to try and do a perfect lap. And that's how I forced myself right through all those laps, still at the back of my mind, thinking, well, these damn Ferraris can come up. It was a classic Moss victory, the underdog in the privateer's car beating the all-conquering works teams, and the public loved him for it. But at Goodwood on Easter Monday 1962, fighting back after a long pit stop, Sterling had the shocking and still unexplained accident that ended his professional career. He nearly died, and after a long convalescence, announced his retirement. Now, Sir Sterling, he's still as popular as ever. To me, Sterling Moss, who never won a world championship, was better than most of the ones who did. I think he was the greatest all-rounder ever. And so, from an English legend to a Scottish one, Jim Clark, a quiet Scottish farmer who, like Moss, was incredibly versatile and, on his day, unbeatable. Jimmy had no desire to be rich or famous. He just loved driving cars fast and turned out to have one of the finest natural talents of all time. Clark never seemed to have an off day and didn't argue or complain. He just got into the car he was given and drove it faster than anyone else. His early efforts in Scottish club racing were just something to do in his weekends off from the farm, but they attracted the attention of Lotus boss Colin Chapman. Thereafter, he never raced for anyone else, and the working relationship between Jimmy and Colin became one of the most successful in motor racing history. The superb Climax-powered Lotus 25 and 33 gave them two world championships, and the brilliant 49 was to become another world beater. But Jim's career wasn't all plain sailing. In the 1961 Italian Grand Prix, he collided with Ferrari star Wolfgang von Trips. The German and several spectators were killed, but Clark was blameless. In 1962, after a great fight with Graham Hill and BRM, he seemed set for his first title until the final race in South Africa. When he was way out in the lead, a loose sump plug leaked oil and the title was gone. But in 1963, he was indomitable, with seven effortless victories in the elegant Lotus Climax and became undisputed world champion. <laughs> I started as an amateur with no idea or no intention of uh, becoming world champion, but uh, it was, I was curious to find out um, what it was like to drive a car fast, to drive on a certain circuit, to drive a certain type of car. By now, Clark was looking at other classes of racing, helped by Ford's hunger for motorsporting credibility. With the Lotus Cortinas, Clark devastated saloon car racing. And then Chapman took Clark to the Indianapolis 500. At his first attempt, he shook the American establishment by finishing second. And in 1965, came victory. Jim Clark crosses the finish line to win the 500 with a comfortable lead of more than two minutes. The same year, he won his second world championship and his hometown of Duns in Berwickshire gave him a hero's welcome. The Ford Cosworth DFV engine arrived in mid-1967 and around it, Chapman built the new Lotus 49. Clark scored its first four victories and 1968 seemed bound to be another championship year. He led the opening round in South Africa from start to finish. It was his 25th Grand Prix victory, breaking Fangio's long-standing record. But that April, in a minor Formula 2 race in Germany, when a rear tyre deflated at 150 miles an hour, even Clark's superhuman skill couldn't save him. His death shocked the world. That the greatest driver of his time should die in a minor race seemed unbearably tragic. 
It was a tragic loss, but Jim Clark's life overlapped that of another great Scottish driver, Sir Jackie Stewart. I regard Jackie as the ultimate professional because not only was he a great driver who won no less than three world championships with Ken Tyrrell's team, but he made an enormous contribution to safety in Formula One. With his fashionable clothes and long hair, Jackie looked like a rock star. But behind the image was a total concentration on what it took to win races. Jackie could have been a clay pigeon shooting champion. As a teenager, he reached Olympic standard and he still shoots for fun. In 1964, Ken Tyrrell spotted Jackie's talent and hired him for his Formula 3 team to begin a unique relationship. I certainly would not be here today if it weren't for Ken Tyrrell. Um, he always gave me the best mechanics, the best engineering, the best equipment, um, and he cared for me better than any man could have cared for a driver. But BRM were the first to sign him for Formula One, and in his first year he won at Monza and finished third in the championship. A brilliant debut season. Then came a terrible crash at Spa, with Jackie trapped in the wreckage, soaked in fuel. He recovered quickly, though, to begin his mission for greater racing safety and follow Jim Clark to the Indy 500, where he came very close to winning. Indy was something I knew nothing about. Um, I had only seen horror pictures of the biggest accidents the world has ever seen. I thought I'd better go and look at it and maybe try a car to see if I could do it because it kind of specialised, yeah. there was no question. And I just went out there and drove basically by the seat of my pants. Of course I found the walls threatening because you were exiting at very high speed and having to commit to the exit very early on. With eight laps to go I was two laps in the lead um, and I had an engine blow up. It was a disappointment. One of the greatest races of all time, in my opinion, was the German Grand Prix, 1968, which you won with a splinted wrist in appalling weather. Uh, maybe my best race ever. Uh, certainly biggest challenge. I, I think the fact that there was so much fog, uh, so dense, that my knowledge of the Nürburgring, even though some people may have driven it more often, I was totally confident about where I was going over rises and out of sight corners. I think that helped me. I had good tyres, I had a good car, I had terrific preparation, and I sort of stayed out of trouble. I never did a lap at the Nürburgring that I didn't have to do because I was right up to here and your, the fear of it was enormous. Your recall really is astounding. And the British Grand Prix 1969, another fantastic race and Jochen Rint was the man you were racing against. Yeah, it was one of the best races I think in, in, in motorsport um, yeah. for quite a long time. Yeah. The race with Jochen was a fantastic race. Going down uh, hangar straight and would overtake me going into stow. Now there was no point in me trying to stop him because he was going to do it so I would back off and let him through. And then I would do the same to him from club up to, to Woodcott. Funny thing happened, one of his rear wing end plates came undone and was rubbing on the tyre and I thought, oh my God, because it's like a razor edge at that speed, a piece of metal alloy. I'm going past him, going down hangar street, pointing with this hand to, to Jochen who's looking at me, look at your rear right wheel. Whether he could have seen it in the mirror, I wasn't sure. But it was, for me, one of the most important races I ever won. In 1969, Jackie won his first title in Amatra, and at Monza, two-tenths of a second covered him, Rint, Beltoise and McLaren. It's over the line together, and it's almost a dead heat. It's Jackie Stewart. For 1970, Tyrrell was building his own car, but until it was ready, used a march. Tragically, though, Jackie's friend, Jochen Rintz, died at Monza, becoming posthumous champion. In 1971, the Tyrrell was unbeatable. Ken's team was working perfectly. Jackie took his third Monaco win and his second title. He was runner-up in 1972 and champion again in 1973. 
But tragedy struck the Tyrrell team at Watkins Glen with the death of Jackie's close friend and number two, Francois Sever, who was destined to be his successor. Francois died on what would have been my 100th Grand Prix. Uh, and he died the day before. And I withdrew in respect to him and Ken, of course, withdrew the other car as well. And it was a sad way to end my career but it only confirmed to me that I had done the right thing. Jackie Stewart made his name and won all his three world championships with a team owned by another all-time great, Ken Tyrrell. Ken was in Grand Prix racing in good times and bad times for over 30 years and he never gave up. He was a truly great man. Now this car is the 1971 Tyrrell. It was the first real Tyrrell and it was designed by Derek Gardner in secrecy and like most of Ken's cars was powered by a Formula One Ford DFV V8 engine. But if you think this car is interesting, have a look at this one because it is an example of Ken Tyrrell's amazing courage, determination and innovation. It's the only six wheel Formula One car that's ever driven in a Grand Prix. Now the reason for those four small wheels in the front is to enable the car to slip through the air more easily and to be able to put more rubber on the ground for better steering and for better braking. Now a man who raced against Ken's cars for 13 years was Austria's greatest ever Grand Prix driver, Niki Lauda, a man of amazing grit and determination. Added to that were a razor-sharp brain, total self-confidence and the ability to ignore criticism. He joined Ferrari in 1974 and immediately set about harnessing the team to his own ambition and capacity for hard work. Well, I came from BRM basically, which was a good car. So when I joined Ferrari at the end of 70. Three, and we together worked really hard to make that car better. And I think I won my second Grand Prix, my first Grand Prix in my life. And from 74 on, we were just going like hell. In 1975, Lauda won the World Championship with five victories. But a year later at the Nürburgring came the fiery accident that so nearly killed him. Several brave drivers dragged him from the flames, but he wasn't expected to live. When I came to the hospital, you know, you, you feel like kind of very, you're very, you feel like you're very tired and you would like to go and sleep. But you know, you know, it's not just going sleeping, it's something else. Incredibly, he was racing six weeks later, but at the final round in Japan, Nikki voluntarily retired. Now, you're an unusual chap in, in, in many ways. And one of the ways in which you've been unusual is to have the strength of character in 76 to say at Fuji, the weather conditions are ridiculous. You could have won the world championship if you hadn't driven out of the race. Absolutely right, but I did come there after nearly being dead at the Nürburgring, so I just was not prepared to take the chance under these terrible weather conditions, if you do remember. Yes, yes. If I would have known the rain would stop, yeah. which was not the case in the beginning, because the problem there was that for about four hours, we delayed the race, all of us, because rivers were running over the circuit. And we, did, we all said we can't race. It was so bad. Half an hour later, the rain stopped. The race got a little better. And James, in the end, finished, I don't know, fourth or something, and won the championship by one point. But from my point of view, it was a year where I had my accident. I was happy to be alive. OK, I lost one championship by one point, but I don't think I did that bad that much. 77, you won the championship again. And then you left the team that you had made and joined Brabham. Why did you do that? <clears throat> the reason was that 76, after I rang Ferrari from Fuji and told him what I told you Enzo now, Ferrari. Enzo Enzo. Ferrari, yeah. I told him uh, it was pretty obvious that he said, OK, I accept your decision and fully packing you up. I didn't lose the oh, race because yeah. I was a chicken in Fuji. I lost the race right. because I nearly killed myself in yeah. a Ferrari. And then Bernie came along and offered me a drive in the Brabham Alfa Romeo, which was the opposition. And therefore I left. And then in the end, looking backwards, it was a mistake. Because I could have won more championships maybe well, with Ferrari. We all make mistakes. When did you first know about the Brabham fan car? 
Raven Fenka, I was told by Gordon Murray when he came up with the idea. Yeah. And I remember very well the first test we did in Branch Hatch with it. It was a small circuit. And I was astonished when they warmed the car up and the car went boom, 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 boom. <laughs> yes. What the hell is going on here? When the race started, I couldn't believe it. I could pass everybody around the outside, <laughs> took the lead and won the race. Lauda won the fan car's only race and at the 1979 Canadian Grand Prix sensationally walked away from the sport. Just before practice started in Montreal, he talked to Jackie Stewart and possibly some of the reasons for his decision were already in his mind. As long as you are in motor racing, it's more boring this in one way because you know all the people, everything is, everything is the same all the time. And it needs special motivation. You know, like if you start when you're 25 years old or 22 years old, you start motor racing. The motivation is there because you want to get in, you want to know everything, you want to win and all that. So if you know everything, you have won a lot of races. You always need new motivations to bring the, the, the push up you need to be successful. So no more driving Bernie Ecclestone's Brabham's. For two years, Nicky concentrated on building up his own airline, a whole new challenge. So you start the airline, you're out, you're out of racing, 81, 80 and 81, you join McLaren and you said, I will win my third race, and you won your third race at Long Beach. Well, first of all, I wanted to see after two years, can you drive again? Because I retired because I was fed up driving. Yeah. And suddenly I won the, the third race, Long Beach. So now everybody was running after me again. And say, oh, we must sign you up for three years. Said, Listen, sign me up for this year. You didn't want to sign me up for this year, perfect. If you want to negotiate next day, you have to pay more money. You.